let's go. Welcome friends in the room. Fort Worth, Houston, El Paso, Fayetteville, Phoenix, Men Hill, North Carolina, Cedar Rapids, wherever you are tuning in from. Houston, let's go. Strohs, close it out. Hey, we are wrapping up this series, Rated R for Romance, as we explore Song of Solomon and this relationship between uh, this couple. And uh, I thought I would start with a couple that I came across, I found out about this past week, named Herbert and Zelmyra Fisher. Who's heard of Herbert and Zelmyra Fisher in here? Nobody, guarantee it. Here's who Herbert and Zelmyra Fisher are. They hold the record for the longest marriage in the modern era. <laughs> hold on, hold on. You don't even know these people. <laughs> Why are you clapping right now? <laughs> these two got married in 1924 and were married for 87 years till he passed away in 2011. They got married at 18 and 17. And when they did in 1924, think about that. Calvin Coolidge was president. Most of you guys don't even know who Calvin Coolidge is. You think that's a cartoon. Babe Ruth was the hero of the day. The Great Depression had not happened. The Roaring Twenties was taking place. We're about to be in the Roaring Twenties again. And this couple, the woman just died off in, in 2013, but for 87 years, they went through uh, two, I know, I know, what's in their genetics, for real, what vitamins or what are they eating? They went through 15 presidential administrations. They survived the Great Depression, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. They were in their 60s and married together and had over four decades of marriage when we landed on the moon. <laughs> that is crazy. They were in their mid to late 60s whenever uh, JFK was assassinated and they just died in 2013. It is the longest recorded marriage in modern history. To find a marriage similar, you would have to almost go back to Abraham and Sarah in the Bible. That is how straight up long these two were together, and they had a marriage that clearly lasted. They had a relationship that far exceeds anything most of us, all of us likely will ever experience in marriage, but what does that have to do with where we're going tonight? We're in a similar way that their marriage uh, was able to stand the test of time. This series has been devoted to helping create and helping us build a foundation for dating, for relationships, for romance from God's word so that you and I can have the best chance at having a marriage that succeeds. And this was almost as if it will, or as if it were a marriage made in heaven. I mean, that's incredible. And tonight, we're gonna wrap up this series and what I wanna do is I wanna give two takeaways and drive them home as clear as I can from God's word in this final chapter of Song of Solomon on what a marriage made from heaven should look like. Inside of the room right now, most of you will be married in the next 10 years. That's not a guarantee and it's not a promise. Statistically, the odds are in your favor. <laughs> and so if that's true, and there are a few decisions in life other than trusting and walking with Jesus and who you're gonna worship, that are more gonna significantly impact your life than who you marry. And so, if you can go in knowing this is what God says marriage is about, this is the type of relationship you should be looking for, who would not want to experience that? A fool is who. And so, we're gonna talk tonight about the last two things from what God says, you wanna have a marriage made in heaven, here's what it looks like. And let me just say something really quick before we dive in. There's a lot of talk in our culture about what marriage is and what it isn't. When it comes to the arena of marriage, biblically, God says you and I don't get to say what it is or what it isn't or what it should look like because he defines marriage. And from the very beginning, he orchestrated this incredible thing that he said, marriage is gonna be a picture and a metaphor of my love for the church. So you can add rules, change rules, do whatever you want, but when you step in the arena of marriage, it's like you're stepping on God's territory as though all of life was not already there. But in a weird way, it's like you're walking, and if you were gonna step towards marriage, like I said, most of you are, you need to know you are stepping towards holy ground, like take off your sandals type of holy ground. And what he says about marriage and what it should look like is gonna define what those of us who experience a marriage made in heaven are gonna have in our relationship. So we're gonna continue the series. We're gonna look at Song of Solomon chapter eight. I'm gonna give two takeaways. I'm gonna read through the text, unpack it. We're gonna give two takeaways from this text, really from the book in general, and we'll get you guys out of here. 
with enough time to see the Astros clinch the World Series. How about that? All right, we'll start in verse five of chapter eight. We uh, continue, in case you're joining us for the first time, here's what Song of Solomon is. It's like the Romeo and Juliet of the Bible. It is a uh, book that was included in the scripture that God celebrates romance between one man, one woman. Who's the one man? His name is King Solomon. He's the king. His married girl, or his boo, was named Shulamite, or Shulamith, and uh, they had this relationship we've traced for the last handful of weeks. If you missed it, you can go check it out on the Porch app or on iTunes or podcast and catch up with us. But they've just had this journey where they went from uh, not in a relationship to dating to engaged, married, honeymoon night, and uh, conflict. And we've just explored. And tonight, we're going to get into the till death do us part part of the song. And it is a song, just to remind you, so it, it goes back and forth. It's very poetic, and it's like the guy sings something, the girl sings something. Every once in a while, the friends kind of chime in and, and give their two cents too. So we're going to pick it up in verse 5 where the friends chime in as they see this couple coming back from this uh, bed and breakfast weekend getaway that they had had we covered last week. So here's it, verse 5. Friends speaking. Who is that coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? So who is that girl riding in that chariot? She's leaning on her boy. Who is that? And they they know it's rhetorical. It's her. And she chimes in and begins to speak to her husband. Under the apple tree where I awakened you or I aroused you, your translation may have. There your mother was in labor with you. There she who bore you was in labor. She basically brings up what feels incredibly awkward and weird to us, but she basically says, like, man, underneath, it's, it's, um, it's an expression of the continuing legacy of love and relationships from their generation to their parents' generation. That means, that's, like, weird for us in this day and age in cultural and Hebrew. It would have been a, uh, affirming and connecting to their legacy of their family tradition. And she's speaking erotically, as we've talked about apple trees having uh, been seen as an aphrodisiac, making love in this particular place. Set me, verse 6. As a seal on your heart, or as a seal on your arm, a seal was like a stamp that someone would have, like in that day and age, people would have a seal, and it would be like, this is a declaration, this is my possession. So I'm putting my seal on different things that I own so that people can know that it's mine. Same thing you do at your apartment with your roommates when you write your initials on the milk, and you're like, hey, nobody else eat this milk because it's got my initials on it. Who ate my milk in here? Or somebody borrowed my clothes, and I clearly put my initials on side of it because I'm declaring what? That's mine, my possession. She's saying... I want you to put that type of thing on your heart with me. Like all of your affections are mine and I'm all of yours and put it on your arm so that people can publicly know and declare through your actions that we are one another's. I'm possessed and I possess my my boy. Verse seven. For love is as strong as death and jealousy is as fierce as the grave. Its flashes are the flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Love is as strong as death. As in, it lasts all the way to the grave. Jealousy is as fierce as the grave. In other words, death in the grave is not selective in who it chooses. And it's gonna, it takes all of us. So jealousy, in the context of marriage, there's like a righteous jealousy that takes place where it is not selective uh, towards being protective of the person that it loves. What do I mean by that? Like inside of the context of marriage, there's a righteous jealousy where you're like, hey, this is my girl. Nobody else, I don't care who you are, uh, is getting near her or spending one-on-one time or talking to her like her husband talks to her. I don't care if you're my best friend or if you're in my family or any of that. I'm protective, and it says it's as fierce as jealousy is as fierce as the grave. Verse eight, or verse seven, many waters or trials when storms of life come cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it out. If a man were to offer, offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. That, wealth, or that love is such a thing that you can't buy it. This would be where you insert the Alicia Keys songs. Some people want it all. I don't want anything at all but your love is basically what she's saying. Verse 8. This is where it takes what I think is the weirdest turn in the entire book. And it goes to like a flashback that her brothers introduced where it says this. We have a little sister, and she has no breasts. And... Uh, you're going, what are they talking about? She's flashing back, and I'll tell you why I say that in a second. But it's her brother speaking, and speaking of an earlier time in life, and by no breasts, they're not like throwing shade at her. They're saying she hasn't gone through puberty yet, and we have a little sister. Verse eight, what should we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build on her battlements of silver. Uh, in other words, if she protects herself as a wall, talking about her purity, 
then we're going to put battlements, you know, a decorative battle stuff. Silver doesn't, uh, you don't make silver for, for battle or for protection. It's just kind of for decoration. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. Dude, I love that. If you have a sister in the room, you know what these guys, these guys are saying right here. What is a door? A door is something that opens to give access to other people. So the brothers are going, hey, if she can't learn to control herself, we are going to board that door up. That's what they're saying. She says, verse 10, I was a wall. So she's, that's why we say it's a flashback. And my breasts are like towers. Dang, girl. Then I was in his eyes like one who finds peace. This verse, man, there's so much in this verse to unpack. Or there's so much in this passage that's beautiful. One is that some scholars think she's like, she's taking a, a jab at the brothers who were like, oh, yeah, I was a sister with no breasts. Now I got some towers. And the other thing is that she says, I was like one who found peace or shalom. And the word shalom is the same translation for the name Solomon. It was as though Solomon found in me peace, and I found my Solomon, or my peace, to this relationship. Solomon had a vineyard, so then she uses a metaphor to talk about their relationship. And she says this, Solomon, that's her husband, had a vineyard at Baal Haman, that's just a place. He leased out the vineyard to keepers, and each one was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, so she says in the same way, my vineyard, talking about her body, all throughout the book, we've, we've addressed her vineyard as her body, is my very own, and is before me, you, O Solomon, may have the thousand, and the keepers of the fruit, 200. She's talking about her body, saying, I'm giving all of the fruits of myself to you. And he says, you who dwell in the gardens with friends and attendants, let me hear your voice. She says, the last line of the book, come away, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on the spice-laden mountains talking about her breasts again. She's basically like, hey, we're going to hit repeat, make love to you all night long, and keep that track rolling. It's essentially where the book ends. Now, what I want to do is I want to cover two takeaways from something that we learned from this couple in this passage and really throughout the entire book that are the marks of a marriage that is made from heaven, but the type of marriage that God wants you to have. And the first one is this. Marriage is a covenant. What do I mean by that? This is really, really important. What is a covenant? That's a word that maybe you've heard before and people will talk and they'll kind of throw it out there. Biblically, you can look at Hebrews 9, you look all throughout the Bible. A covenant is a relationship that two parties enter into and it is only able to end by death of one party. It is a covenant that people are into, and it's till death do its part every single time. You cannot get out of it in the same way you would get out of a contract. A lot of you guys are in contracts with AT&T, and you're like, dude, if they could beat Verizon, or if Verizon could beat them, I would go over to them in a heartbeat, and that's a contract. A covenant is a relationship that you mutually enter into that can only end in death. Marriage, biblically, is a relationship where two people enter into that can only be ended by death. It is the fact that it is a covenant, and the reason... The text says, love is as strong as death. It matches it all the way to the grave. They are entered into a relationship that is a covenant that lasts an entire lifetime. That's what their marriage is. That's what marriage biblically is. This is why the couple uh, can have the mark of jealousy and it be a righteous thing. Because they've entered in and they've agreed, man, I'm his, he's mine for life. I have possession over this person. And there can be a righteous jealousy to that. You may think like jealousy every time is all bad. That's not true. Jealousy can be, hey, I rightfully have rights over this thing in this marriage. God, we're told, has jealousy over you. You know that? That he yearns jealously over his people who are rightfully his. Now, what is not righteous jealousy, let me just say this, because this probably is something that consistently, one of the things that gets asked by people, what's not righteous jealousy and what this does not apply to is uh, those of us in the room who are in dating relationships who jealousy is just kind of like our, we just claim it as that's just kind of who I am. Now I need to see your phone and see who you've been texting or see what DMs, you know, other girls or you've been passing on to other girls are. That type of jealousy is not what the Bible's talking about. And generally speaking, let me just say something, like that type of jealousy or the type of jealousy where the guy's like, hey, I can't believe that you were talking to that guy. Uh, you know, I'm about to go punch that dude right in the face. You're like, what, easy, he was taking my order at Starbucks. That's the guy that I was talking to. Why are you gonna punch that type of jealousy is not what the Bible says is a healthy or righteous, typically good thing. In fact, let me just be like a friend here and a big brother to you. Typically, when I hear someone talk about, hey, uh, my girlfriend is just so controlling. She wants to see my phone. She wants to see who I've been talking to. 
or the guy or the girl's describing about how my boyfriend, he just like struggles with rage or jealousy. Those are consistently red flags. And if you are experiencing those, you should be concerned. Why do I say that? Almost every time that that's happening, one of two things is happening. Either the girl, in that scenario, if she's the jealous one or the guy, if they're the jealous one, they are using, or there's some baggage from the past that they have just not worked through. And so they hide behind the banner of, I'm just slow to trust. And it's because they haven't healed from their past baggage. The Bible says that love always trusts in 1 Corinthians 13. So that if, as a Christian, you do not get the excuse to hide behind, you know, I just don't trust people easily. So if they're in that scenario, there's either baggage from their past or current baggage of their present. Maybe somebody cheated on them, something painful happened in their past, but generally it's like, dude, she hasn't healed from that, or you are a sleazeball and not trustworthy. And it's typically one of those two scenarios. Either way, it's not a great reflection of the relationship where it's like, oh, no, 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 she doesn't have any baggage. I'm just a total sleazeball. Not a great sign of the relational health. So if you're in that scenario, you should at least have some concern and be thoughtful about that. Why can I not trust this person? Is it baggage that I need to heal from and you need to own? Or are you dating people who are not trustworthy? And you should not date people who are not trustworthy, who are not worthy of your trust or have not proven worthy of your trust. But this, in this covenant context, there was an appropriate jealousy that was being displayed here because it was a covenant. So marriage is a covenant. A covenant can only end in death. Most of you are gonna get married in the next 10 years. You're gonna step into something God says is mine. And it is a relationship that I have said only ends in death. Wait, David, what about divorce? Doesn't that end a relationship? Or can't a marriage end in divorce? I mean, I've seen all kinds of relationships. My parents' marriage ended in a divorce or a divorce took place in my marriage. So am I saying that that actually was not the dissolving of that relationship? Maybe. Jesus is asked about marriage in Matthew chapter 19. And he's asked by these guys who come up to call Pharisees, who are basically like the just uh, kind of uh, religious leaders of the day. They're coming to trap Jesus and they go up and they're like, hey Jesus, what are the scenario and circumstances when it's okay to divorce uh, your wife. And Jesus gives him this answer. This is Matthew chapter 19, verse three. The Pharisees came up and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, have you not read, that's Jesus speaking, that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore, there are no longer two, but they are one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man separate. People come up like, Jesus, hey, what are the circumstances under which it's okay to get a divorce? If they cheat on you, if they you know, are just mean to you, if you just don't like them that day, if you, you know, you're ready to move on, when is it okay? And Jesus, in response to them saying, when is it permissible, gives an answer that reflects, I'm not even sure it's possible that the state of Texas may recognize your divorce, but that doesn't mean that God does. That there may be a scenario where people came together and they're like, hey, you know, mutually irreconcilable differences, we're kind of over this, and you have stamped it and you have seen it divorce, but that doesn't mean that God says the marriage is over in his eyes or that that person is free to remarry because God says marriage is mine and when you bring those two together, it's as though I fuse them into one and it is hard to unwind what God made, one. It's like this, there's an old illustration we've used here before where if I take this and I'm to pour what represents one person in the relationship and this is you, guys is blue and ladies, as close as we get to pink, and I pour this in here and then I decided, you know, I'm not really digging the whole like, what is that, like crimson or maroon? I'm just gonna separate these things back out and I try to pour the blue back in here and the red back in here, it wouldn't work because they've moved together and the Bible says, as crazy as this is, and I need you to hear me because this is what you are walking into. That there isn't some like, hey, if this doesn't work out, we'll just hit the ejection button. God says, you have moved together in a way that you cannot unwind and separate from one another. Now, there are people who disagree or there are people who would say, inside of the Bible, there's two exceptions. If they abandon you or if there's adultery, 
those would be times where the marriage would dissolve. And um, I don't have time to get into all the different uh, scenarios and opinions, but godly people would disagree. But here what, here's what everyone would agree on. Marriage is a big deal to God. It is something you should not take lightly. He does not take lightly. And he says in Ephesians chapter five, it is a reflection of me and my love for the church. And the reason why you cannot just leave is because I do not just leave. And every time a marriage is broken apart, especially by Christians, it is an indictment or it is a poor reflection of what my covenant, Jesus speaking, and his love to his bride, the church. Marriage is a covenant that only ends in death. If you're interested, you can go check out our Real Truth real quick by our senior pastor, Todd. Type in Real Truth real quick. Type in divorce. You can find out more answers on specifics of that stuff. There's people who disagree on some of the uh, implications or some gray areas, but no one disagrees. Marriage is a big deal. In Malachi chapter 2.16, God says, I hate divorce. And if you've come from a home like I did, it's no wonder why. Because of the pain and the destruction that divorce introduces to the couple, to the children, to the family, to anyone who's involved. I feel the pain of divorce at every holiday, as I know many of you do. Sadly, more and more, just as a pastor, you get to, I'm a part of weddings all the time, and it is a rare thing for me to do a wedding where the bride and the groom both have parents who stay together. And it becomes this whole orchestration of, you know, here's my mom and stepfather, and who's gonna sit where, and who's gonna say her mother and I? And it is a tragic thing, and God, who loves you, doesn't want you to experience that. So as someone who is incredibly vested in your success and your future marriage being amazing, because marriage is amazing. I want you to go in with eyes wide open, and my whole goal for this talk is for you to go in going, whoa, that's a really big deal, which is exactly how the disciples responded to Jesus' teaching. In other words, at the end of Jesus saying that, the disciples would go, <laughs> whoa, Jesus, that was a little intense. Uh, if that's the case, maybe it's better to not marry. And Jesus isn't like, oh, no, guys, it's the best. Are you kidding me? No, you got to try it. It's so great. He just basically kind of walks off. He's like, some people can accept it, some people can't. He walks off. But yes, it is a big deal. And you need to know you are entering into a covenant. So that's the first thing, that marriage, by definition, is a covenant. The second is that marriage and love, and this is a two-point message tonight. In marriage, love is a choice. Uh, and so there's a lot of debate, even as I was thinking and working on this message this week, and uh, I know some of you guys right now are disagreeing with me, like, yeah, sometimes it's a choice, but, you know, other times it isn't. And there's even things that we talk about in culture where, like, you know, love is a verb, or love is a noun, or love is a feeling, or love is these different expressions that's kind of like, you know, we disagree and we agree, and it's kind of all of them, right? No, biblically, love is a choice, and it's a command in marriage. Uh, what do I mean by that? The word, so this is getting a little bit heady. Everybody put the thinking caps on. Here we go. This is an educated crowd, though, and listening in. I'm confident you've got this. In Hebrew, which is the original language Song of Solomon was written. You guys follow me? In the original language, there are three different words in the book of Song of Solomon for love. Each of them has a different variation. In other words, in Hebrew, there are three ways that you can talk about love or three types of love. In English, we're pretty simple. So we just like to use love. So we're like, I love chocolate, and I love the Astros, and I love her, and God, I love you. We use the same word. In Hebrew, there's different expressions that you would use for different scenarios. There's three types of love. The first love is called raya. It's in the book. It's a companion love. Like, you're my companion, my friend. I feel affection. You can have this kind of like, hey, we're platonic, just bros here. That's the type of love. The second type of love is dode. This is erotic or sexual love. This was like the honeymoon night. That's what they were using there, dode, D-O-D. The third type of love is the love that they mention in this chapter. It's called ahava, A-H-A-V-A. It is a word that by definition means a love of decision. It's a, it's a word that, that literally comes from the root to give of oneself, to decide to give of oneself. It is the type of love that says, hey, I see everything messed up and no matter how hard it gets, I'm not going anywhere. It's not the erotic love, which can't make a marriage last. It's not just the companion, hey, you're my buddy love. It is a I am committed and I'm keeping the covenant love. That's what the ahava is in that text. The ahava is the one that is stronger than death or is as strong as death. By definition in here, it is that love is a deciding love. It is a choice that you make. That's what is mentioned here. Uh, biblically, 
In Ephesians chapter five, the apostle Paul would pick this up and he would say, hey, husbands, here's how you should think about love. Here's what he says, Ephesians chapter five, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and that he gave himself up for her. That's nuts in our day and age. Here's what I mean. Like, if you think about it, the, the level of times, the number of times that people are like, look, I just don't love her anymore, or I'm not in love with her anymore. Paul would say, here's what I hear you saying, um, 21st century person. Uh, you are directly rejecting the command of God in your life. And you're, you're choosing to say, hey, God, I'm choosing to be disobedient to what you command in Bible. Like, think about that. Like, like Paul would say, look, it's not... Husbands love your wife when you are in love, or husbands love your wife when you feel love. It is husbands love sacrificially lay down your life for your wife. It is a command. It is a choice. And in marriage, it is not an optional thing. It is I'm making the decision. I am laying down my life. My desires and my preferences come second to yours and mutually doing that together with your spouse. Love is a choice. It is not a feeling, it's not a feeling that, that uh, hey, I only do this whenever I feel like it. Biblically, listen to me. Love is a command of God. And as soon as you enter into that, and this is what makes marriage both amazing and really hard, because here's what marriage is. It is one day of dying to yourself after the next, after the next, after the next. Like, dude, let me be honest. Marriage is amazing, because this is the tension that I feel. It's like, you don't want to have people be like, oh my gosh, I'm never getting married. And you don't want also people to be like, yes, it's amazing. Our love will, will last us through a lifetime. You know, it's going to be great. And I want you to walk in with sober. Like, marriage is amazing, dude. Like, it's incredible. And um, it's one of the greatest gifts. You can have sex whenever you want or whenever they're willing. And you can just have an amazing time together. And you've got this friend. And, and you're always there. Like, it's awesome. It's the greatest thing ever. And yet, it is also really, really hard. And one of the reasons it's hard is because love is a command in the Bible where you constantly have to go, I have to die to myself. And I'm choosing not to just do what I want in this moment but to put the needs of the person in front of me there. Here's why this matters, because you are going to step into a marriage and there's gonna come a day you're gonna wake up and you're not gonna feel like loving that person that day because here's what happens in dating. Like in dating, dude, you guys, man, you just have no idea. Here we go. In dating, you're in this stage right now, I remember it, where opposites attract and you're like, oh man, they're so quiet. It's like they're so mysterious over there and everything about them, you're like, gosh. And then you get in marriage and you're like, uh, is anything going on in there at all? You're so quiet. And the thing that attracted you, all of a sudden you want to attack them for. There was a psychologist who said opposites attract, and then in marriage they attack. And so all of a sudden you go from, man, she's just so fun-loving and like just free spirit, and I'm just kind of buttoned up, and, and it's just great to have her around. And then you get in marriage, and, and it becomes not like she's so fun-loving. It's like, do you ever focus on anything so the guy, you're like, I just love that he's athletic. And then you get married, and you're like, all he cares about is sports. That's it. That's all he cares about. Whatever the thing that you're like, man, this is the thing that I really like about this person, all of a sudden you find yourself going, man, I'm not sure that I like them. She's so sweet, turns into she doesn't have an opinion or a backbone at all. That's what it becomes. And in that moment, in those times, and in those, those scenarios, you have to make the decision, I I'm not going to listen to whatever lies I may be tempted to believe. I love this woman. I love this man. And I'm choosing to lay down my wife, to lay down my life, not my wife. <laughs> Though if they let you. <clears throat> in marriage. In marriage. <laughs> in marriage. I have lost my place. You are choosing. Hey, I'm putting the needs and the cares of this person in front of me. The Apostle Paul would say, here's what love does. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a verse that you probably heard before, love bears all things. <laughs> I apologize, man. I'm gonna get an email for that. Let's just get that out of the way. I apologize, okay? Love bears all things. It endures all things. It believes all things, hopes all things. Love never ends. Love in marriage, I hope you never ever wonder this question again, is a command. God commands it, and any husband and any wife who says, no, I'm not doing that, says, I reject the word of God, and I am choosing to live in rebellion against it. It is a command. It is not optional, and it is not feelings-based. And as you go into marriage, you need to make sure you have a lock 
on that idea and that truth from God's word. You got a lot of expectations, you need to go in expecting. There's gonna be days I do not feel like this and I'm gonna have to say, die to self and I'm choosing to put you and your needs in front of me and I don't want to and I don't feel like it and I'm choosing to do that. It's like this, all of us came into the room and there's different expectations that fill kind of your mind and your heart as it relates to what your marriage life is gonna look like someday. Here's what different expectations you need to, Come out. Here's an expectation you need to make sure. Like, what do I mean by that? Like, truly, I remember being single. There's just different things you're thinking, whether it's like when I'm going to get married, what this person's going to look like, what a wedding day is going to look like, what kind of a life is going to look like. So you're going to go in there, and most of us in the room probably expect, maybe there's some of us that don't, but you're going to get married someday. So here's your wedding ring. You're going to get married. Even the timing, you're like, yeah, probably, you know, before 30 for sure, but not till after 25 because, you know, I got to get some things in order. And so your expectation would be, hey, someday I'm going to get married. And of course, of course. <laughs> Of course, right? There's going to be lots of great sex in marriage. That's a great expectation. And this is just an expectation that in your marriage box, if you will, you've got the expectation of, hey, we're going to have great sex. And maybe your expectation is someday, you know, we're going to travel the world and we're going to go see, uh, what is this, Eiffel Tower of Paris. We're going to see things together. And, oh, of course, some point we're going to have little ones. And here we are just walking in the woods together. We're doing family photos. I mean, that's an expectation I have. And we're all dressing up here the same. And, of course, we're doing matching pajama pictures at Christmas time, and this is your expectation. And you got a million of them, some said, some unsaid. Guys, you, you're probably going like, I don't even know exactly which ones I, I have expectations on. Where's the sex one again? That's pretty much it. <laughs> Whatever they are, but all of us came in the room with expectations. <laughs> we got a dog in here for some reason. <laughs> House, we're gonna have this white picket fence together. We're gonna wake up and have our quiet times. It's just gonna be incredible. It's always gonna be great. Coffee, quiet time, yes, please, namaste in bed. Then we're going to grow old together and sit on this park bench. Somehow I've got another of the pajama things popping in here. All of those are great. I hope that every expectation that you have and every hope and dream and whatever those things that, you know, you've thought about, and this is going to be so sweet and I can't wait till all of those happen. And put them in your box. Put them in the marriage expectation box. None of that is wrong. I want to make sure you leave with the expectation that included in my box needs to be the covenant-keeping love, that ahava, that I'm deciding to stay even when it's really hard. Even when I don't want to, I'm deciding that I'm going to love you and sacrifice and lay down my life for you. Biblically, the Bible says, greater love has no, per no man than this, then he lays down his life. And the decision in marriage is a constant. I'm putting the needs of my spouse before myself. I'm choosing to be God's provision and to be an extension of God's grace to this person and to serve them and to care of them. And I'm not going anywhere, no matter what happens. And you need to make sure that in that marriage box, you know it's gonna be hard. It's got lots of great things. And there's gonna be times where I am not going anywhere. And you need to make sure the person you marry above everything else has that in there and that you above any other expectation have that in your marriage box. In conclusion, marriage is a covenant. And love inside of marriage is a choice. Song of Solomon has been God's design and celebration of just the, the incredible gift of romance. But as I wrap up and I'm landing the plane, just having done this week after week and seen it for the last 10 years, there's like this underlying lie that I think a lot of people believe as it relates to marriage. And, and here's the lie, that like marriage can fix and fill something empty inside of me. Like, like as soon as I get married, then life really begins and then I can really you know, experience satisfaction and that's where life is. And, and uh, you know, until that, I'm just kind of on the waiting room or I'm just waiting for life to begin. And it's a lie. And as long as you look for someone and that some person on this planet that can fill and fix some emptiness or some void that you find inside of yourself, you are looking for a solution that will never work. It, it, let me explain it like this. My favorite Apple product ever is the AirPods. Thank you. And uh, I think this is like the greatest invention Apple has ever made. Anybody have AirPods in here before? Anybody have AirPods? You guys gotta get AirPods, like for real. Tonight, you should leave the application from this message. <laughs> Go materialism. 
So in the AirPods, here's, here's one of the things that I love about them. Like you can throw one in, I can take calls. It sounds like the phone's up in my ear. You know, I can, I can double click it and it pauses the thing. I can have just one in, I can have both in, I can have the right in, I can have either. I can in bed now, if my wife's going to bed, I can be like, hey, I'm gonna you know, throw this in, watch some Netflix or do whatever. And, uh, and I, can, I can have that in my ear. And sometimes if I do that, I'll wake up the next morning and if you've ever slept with an earpod in your ear, it's like, it's like on your forehead or you're looking for it somewhere in the bed and you can't find it. And inevitably, it's like run out of battery. And here's what's interesting about these AirPods is, is uh, there's two of them. They're a pair, a match, if you will. You got one, you got its mate. And when this thing is low on battery, you know what's crazy? And this thing has full battery? I can't get this to fill this thing up. It can't despite the fact that they're really complimentary, I mean, they were made to work together when they do work together, it's incredible, but when one is lacking something or one is empty, despite the fact that this may have something, or have plenty inside of it, it cannot fill what is lacking and what is empty in the other one. Marriage can fix your singleness and address your singleness. It cannot fill your emptiness. And there is something inside of every single human heart that from the moment that you were born, there has been a, a vacuum or a hole inside of your heart and the temptation for most people on the planet is to think, hey, you know what? I bet this person could fill what is lacking, what is empty inside of me. I bet it could come alongside and, and they could fill and you have bought a lie because that hole was placed there by God so that you would know and reach out and find him, that it would lead you and point you to him. Marriage and love will not satisfy you. And if you are empty, Today, you will not experience a fullness or a satisfaction tomorrow. You'll have it for about a week, and then it'll be gone. Solomon, tragically, never, or I guess he did learn it. He learned it the hard way. What do I mean? The lesson that marriage cannot satisfy you. Like love and marriage, it will not satisfy you. Getting married today, you don't have to wait to get over your singleness. You don't have to wait till you're married someday. It's not going to fill some hole in your heart. And Solomon, his story from here really is kind of tragic. I don't know if you know much of the story of Song of Solomon. It's kind of the irony of the book. As he starts off, he's this young king, and they have this amazing marriage. They write a love song together. It's a manual on sex and romance. And you would think if anybody in the world, you know, they got it. They're the couple to look to. And of course, you know, they're growing old, sitting on that park bench together somewhere. It was not the case. Solomon didn't find the love he was looking for in this relationship, and eventually it grew cold. And one decision after the next, after the next, Solomon was king. And we're told in 1 Kings chapter 11 that he decided to look for a filling a void and a hole in his heart. And one of the ways he did it was after marriage, after marriage, after marriage. Here's what it says, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 2 through 4. There were nations from which the Lord had told the Israelites you must not intermarry with them. So God had said, hey, there's some people, I don't want you to intermarry because they will turn your hearts after other gods. Hey, you marry foreign women or foreign men, you're gonna worship foreign gods, so don't do that. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines, which is just like a living girlfriend not officially married to and his wives led him astray. And as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his hearts, or his heart after God's, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. Think about that. Like we read past the verse and it's like 700, oh yeah, you know, that's kinda cool, if it's in the Bible, I don't get most of the stuff in here. Think about that. 700 times he stood before a woman and said, man, she's it. She's the one. You gotta be thinking at some point, he's going, this is gonna be the love that finally fills some love. Like, this is the girl. And we don't know what happened exactly. Like, maybe maybe Shulamith died. Maybe she died and their love story was over and out of his heartbreak, he just spent one day after the next after the next looking for some sort of love that could fill that hole that he felt was left behind from her. We're not told any of that. We don't know. But 700 times, he stood in front of another woman and said, man, she's it. She's gonna be the one. And it didn't satisfy. And he kept chasing, and he kept chasing, and he kept looking, and he kept looking. The love that you are looking for, 
It's not in some other person. And Solomon discovered that after hundreds of times. I mean, he was getting married every day for two years straight. And he came up empty. And it cost him. Because of his decision and his heart getting turned, God said, I'm ripping the kingdom from your son's hand. And Solomon, in his old age, we're told that he writes this book called Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes was what he wrote at the end of his life, and he writes, and he basically goes like, man, I've chased everything. I chased women. I chased the party. I chased building. I chased success. I got more money than you. I got more ladies than you. I got more cribs than you. I got more than you will ever have. And I'm just telling you, this is the point of the book. All of it is meaningless. Unless you get beyond the sun. That's how he puts it in the book. Underneath the sun, all of this stuff is meaningless. And he, he gives the inference, like, unless you can get beyond the sun, or what translation, outside of this world, you will never find the love you're looking for, the satisfaction you are looking for. Friends, some of you came in here tonight, and you are so discouraged and so just beat down by the fact that you're not married, and you have bought this lie that one day, if I just got married, I'd be satisfied. And the story of Solomon is that you are looking for a love that you're not gonna find in the arms of another man or the arms of another woman. And he did it 700 times and he came up empty. Because it is a hole that God placed there. And Solomon wrote that. In his old age, he wrote this in Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse 11, as we finish the plane. God has made everything beautiful in its time. Listen to this. He has put eternity into man's heart. What does that mean? It means there's a hole in your heart that nothing unless it is eternal can fill because God put it there. And he put it there so that you would have this ache every single day and every time that you go to a relationship and it never satisfies where you would go, man, there's gotta be something else beyond the sun. There's gotta be something in this life or something out there that could fill this ache and this hole that is there. And God said, I put that there so you'll constantly look to me. The love that you have been looking for, the love that you were born for, and man, I hope you get this so bad beyond anything else. And some of you are getting this, where you're discovering, and your like singleness right now is not the defining characteristic of your life. Like you came in at night and you're like, yeah, I'm single. I, mean, I don't know if I'm ever going to get married. But Jesus, you're enough. You're all I want. You're all I've ever wanted. You're all that I need and everything that I want in this life. And will you give me more of yourself and help me to trust you and know you and walk with you? And it's like the more that you begin to know and walk with God, the more you experience that. And I know you're going, oh, it's easy for you to say, you know, because you're married. I can tell you as someone who is married, it doesn't satisfy And if you're sitting in the audience and you're going, yeah, I mean, God would be great and heaven would be awesome, but... You know, I still just want to get married, and God, please don't come back till I get married. Think about that. That's saying, I mean, heaven's great, but I think marriage would probably be better than heaven. And as someone who has been married for seven years, it is not. It's amazing. It's not the love you were looking for. It won't fill the hole in your heart because it wasn't designed to. And as long as you think it will, you're going to put expectations on your mate in that relationship, fill me up, fill me up, and it can't, unless it is connected to a source of life. And in this circumstance with us, the source of life is not some charger, it is God, your creator, who loves you, who proved that love by dying in your place. That is the love you've been looking for your entire life. And it is the love that your entire life, you'll either walk with, accept, an experience, or you will continue to look for it because here's what I promise. You're not gonna find it in marriage. But that love is looking for you if you'll accept it. And it's a love that perfectly displayed itself to you 2,000 years ago where the lover of your soul and the one you were made for became a man and died for you and for me, for anyone who trusts in him. Let me pray. Father, I pray, God, I pray for every dating couple in this room and listening right now online and listening at different 17 locations that you would protect them from making a decision and marrying someone who is not your will, who doesn't love you and doesn't know you, who will not be a wife or a husband or a mom or a father someday. 
who will honor you and walk with you, would you break them up, God, tonight, as they listen and hear my voice at a later time, would you break them up? I pray for any engaged couple, would you protect them and would they pursue purity? I pray, God, would you raise up a generation of people who know you and walk with you and they marry together for the purpose, not of fulfilling each other, but fulfilling the mission you put us on the planet for, knowing you and making you known. Would you raise up inside of this room hundreds and hundreds of marriages and to those listening in other places, hundreds of marriages who know that the ultimate meaning in life is not from marriage, it comes from you. And would you destroy and end relationships and your spirit be heavy on anyone who doesn't need to be in one? I pray for healing, God, for sexual abuse that's taken place, baggage that we carry, that you would just work and heal in our hearts. I pray for pornography addictions that need to end, that you would kill them, you would expose them. I pray that you would make us incredible lovers because we love and know you. Make us servants, God. Would we decrease and you increase? In Jesus' name, amen.